Um, hope you managed to grab some coffee and catch up on emails or ignore your emails. That's definitely what I did. Um, uh, and without further ado, I'm really uh, pleased to announce our second panel this morning, which is going to be focusing on digital inequalities, the barriers facing young and old. So the aim of this panel is to really bring experts from all generations together to host an open discuss discussion about digital inclusion, inequality, and the individual experiences of the online world. The Digital Youth in Index will also be used to steer discussions on the reality of the online world for young people with panelists aiming to unpack its findings. So first I'd like to introduce our chair for today's panel, Sonia Livingston, lead consultant for General Comment 25 on the UN Convention of Rights of the Child. Uh, Lizzie Coles Kemp from the Department of Information Security at Royal Holloway University of London, Jess Barrett from Voicebox, Cliff Manning, Research and Development Director at Parent Zone, and member of Digital Youth Index Advisory Board, and finally uh, Sally West, Policy Manager at Age UK. So Sonia, I'll hand over to you now. Brilliant, thank you so much, and um, it's a pleasure to be here and to um, be hosting this uh, conversation uh, today. So. Um, in fact, you've already um, got a sense of who the panel is. Um, my understanding of this conversation um, in the next hour is to bring together um, perspectives that don't often uh, get joined, actually. There's a lot of discussion uh, in the worlds of um, internet use, uh, digital society and internet governance about young people. In fact, they were just partly the focus um, of the earlier panel. Um, and there is some discussion about older people. I actually think that's a growing conversation, though I'll be interested to hear um, what the other panellists um, have to say. But I, for one, have not often heard them come together um, in a single conversation to try to kind of identify uh, what are the issues and whether these two generations are facing some similar issues or very different kinds of issues when it comes uh, particularly to questions of digital inclusion and digital um, inequality. Uh, so um, we have some uh, great um, expertise on the panel and when we um, met earlier uh, for our kind of pre-discussion um, we were bubbling over with ideas so I'm looking forward to uh, sharing those with you. Um, I, um, I, it, it was nice to be introduced as I'm contributing to general um, comment 25. Um, really, I have a researcher hat on and I spend most of my time researching with people, um, very often younger people um, and parents. Uh, but I have a new research project that is now going to look across three generations. So I'm um, uh, listening here for, for the questions, really, that, that folks have in mind. Uh, I am assured that all um, uh, UK IGF conversations have the purpose of, um, in addition to sharing expertise, uh, listening for um, possible recommendations to take to the main um, uh, global IGF, which is coming up soon. Um, so, and we will try to kind of direct the conversation towards recommendations and actions that may be needed. So in a moment, I'm going to ask each of the speakers to do a kind of two minutes uh, introducing themselves and the key issues as they see them uh, on the barriers facing old and young people in our digital society. Um, I'll just start out with um, a few um, facts and figures from Ofcom to set the scene, um, because in uh, this year, uh, they found that for the younger generation, 16 to 24, 99% use the internet at home, only 24% um, only via a smartphone, which I think is an interesting new trend. They use multiple platforms and apps, as probably we know. And by contrast, the 65 plus, uh, only 73% use the internet at home. So there's a question about the quarter that don't. And half of them are what Ofcom calls narrow users. Um, and again, I think there are some questions that we might want to address about what are um, expected or normative or um, appropriate users. Maybe narrow is good, though it sounds bad. Um, interestingly, uh, that uh, Ofcom research also found that the older group is more confident than the younger of identifying scams, advertising, and um, a bit more knowledgeable about how companies collect their personal data. So some of those questions about use don't necessarily translate into questions about um, skill. I have some, lots of questions in my head as I read those um, reports, and I hope you do too. Um, are these the right indicators? Um, do they indicate important problems? And especially how do we go from what is to what should be? What does good look like? 
Um, what are we going to say about how age and generation intersects with uh, poverty or other indicators of inequality or exclusion, and particularly with the cost of living uh, crisis? Um, are we happy with um, uh, the broad labels young? Actually, Ofcom has detailed data on children. I think uh, we might want to say something about the concept of 65 plus and just what that um, covers. And, and the big question for me uh, now is really, what, is there merit in bringing these two conversations and detailed attention to these two generations? Is there merit in bringing them together? How are we going to compare them? Are we going to call each of these generations vulnerable and in need of um, uh, better provision or better um, internet governance in some ways? Um, so those are the questions in my mind. I hope there are um, those and others in yours. Um, and I'll now ask each of the panel to introduce themselves, say a few words about how they see the digital inequalities barriers. Um, they, they may want to talk about just younger people or just older people or both. I leave that um, to them uh, to decide. Um, and I'm going to turn first to Jess if I may, who I know has been reading um, Nominet's recent Digital um, Youth Index um, and ask what you see as the pressing issues for uh, young people and digital access today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm Jess Barrett. I'm here to represent Voicebox, which is a social enterprise run by young people for young people. So we really pay attention to what young people are dealing with, with the internet and the struggles they have of digital inequality and the cost of living crisis. Um, reading the uh, Digital Youth Index, I find that tackling digital skills seems to be more difficult than tackling digital access. It's a lot harder to provide support and some form of guidance for both the young and the older generations that they're both going to listen to and also you know, there are organizations and charities and council groups that can provide some form of digital access, whether it's through a library computer or I don't know, some form of sharing in a community, but it, they don't necessarily have people who are going to go around houses and teach older generations or younger people about digital safety and privacy. Um, Something that also concerned me is that young people are still sometimes looked at as the, the lead person in the family who has the most digital knowledge and they lack the life experience and critical thinking to be put in that position. I mean, I, I know I certainly did when I was 13 and got my first phone or when I was 15 and finally figured out Instagram. Um, and I was teaching my parents how to use Facebook and Instagram and what it all meant. And I had no idea about privacy and safety. And I used the same password for everything. Um, and it's pressure that they don't need when they're also trying to figure out how to behave safely on the internet, especially with the increasing digitalization. Um, and one other thing I'll say is um, the cost of living crisis is also creating a problem for students because they may or may not be able to afford a decent Wi-Fi connection. And during this winter, are they going to be able to afford the energy bills to keep them warm and safe? And also the Wi-Fi payments to be able to actually complete their January exams if they're still online or any coursework so it affects them in multiple ways Brilliant. thank you yes I think it's a very um, sobering moment to be having this conversation about um, inequality and inclusion in, in, in relation to uh, digital society actually in relation to um, society uh, more broadly um, and the pandemic um, has changed things. And as you say, Jess, the cost of living crisis is, is changing things also. Um, Sally, can I turn to you next and ask you to give a, a sense of, yes, the perspective of the older generation? Yeah, well, thank you very much. And yeah. really pleased and such what, 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 yeah. what a good idea to be bringing yeah. us together in this way. Mm. So I'm Sally West. I'm um, in the policy team at Age UK. Mm. I work at the national office of Age UK, the old people's um, organisation, but we also have around about 120 
local HEKs. Mm. And Lizzie started off with some of the some of the stats. Um, as we know, older people are less likely to be online, and particularly mm. if you look at the 75 or older, again, um, online use goes down, as as you might expect. So I think for us at HEK, we are very interested in this whole area of digital inequality. We work, we do a lot of work, particularly through our local organisations to support older people to perhaps use the internet for the first time, to um, gain digital skills, become confident. Um, and it's interesting, um, just talking about, it's harder to gain skills because it isn't just sitting in front of a computer or sitting in front of a, uh, a screen with your, your granddaughter or your family members, because they're, as Jess said, they're not always the people who, who know most about supporting somebody to be using the internet. But the other thing at HUK is that we, we kind of think it's really important for those people who aren't online or maybe not yet online because they, they can't or they're really not interested, that people should still be able to access services and support and people shouldn't be digitally, shouldn't be excluded because they're not digitally engaged. Um, I suppose just briefly, the impact of not being online. Um, I have to say that for some people that we talk to, they say it's not a problem. You know, I, I remember we did a project recently talking to people who weren't online and somebody said, well, me and my wife, we live very quietly. We prefer to go to the shops. We don't want to be doing online shopping. We can get to the bank. You know, for, for us at the moment, it's not such an issue. But I think increasingly we're hearing from people who are finding life difficult because bank has closed down because they can't get a GP's appointment because the local authority says you've got to go online to get this that and the other um or they spend well, we all do this a long time in a, on a telephone line with the recorded message saying go to www and you just say I want to speak to a person um so I think life is getting difficult for some it's getting frustrating and people are either dependent on other people or they are becoming less engaged and maybe not getting some of the support they need. Thank you. Um, I think you really bring out uh, very well, Sally, the way in which uh, it is the design of the wider society that matters, that we find ourselves in. If, if society embraces all things digital and only digital, then those who don't engage with it are excluded. Uh, it's not just, we, we often talk as if it's a matter of individual choice. Do you want to get online? What do you want to do online? But it does very much matter what the, what the um, decisions being made about all of those different authorities and businesses that, that now seem to be um, online only. Um, Cliff, can I come to you next and ask, um, you work with multiple generations, um, uh, speak for uh, your perspective, thank you. Yeah, thank you, it's been great to hear everybody's views already. <clears throat> so um, I'm Research and Development Director at Parent Zone, um, for those who are unaware, Parent Zone is a social enterprise that aims to improve outcomes for children and young people by um, bridging the gaps between families, platforms, policies, and professionals that support them. Um, so we work with families in the broader sense, and often that includes uh, uh, older, older generations, grandparents, as well as uh, parents and uh, professionals um, across that. Our work is focused on improving the outcomes for children in a connected world, as I say, and the two levers for improving outcomes are parenting and poverty. Um, so our work focuses primarily on how we can improve um, the quality of parenting that children receive from whoever uh, is in their lives to deliver that and the professionals that might help them to do that. What we're seeing increasingly is that our work is also being connected to poverty. Um, and so we, we see digital affordability, <coughs> access, etc. We see that families are struggling with that. Um, um, in terms of barriers that children, and young people face and families face, um, um, in the Digital Youth Index that Nominet produced recently, um, I think it says 26% of children, and young people don't have a laptop or similar device and are reliant mostly on mobile devices. And we see that as a, so you can see there's a, a shift in the types of use being, being used there as well. And I think one of the, the challenges really is around Digital can kind of exacerbate existing power dynamics. Um, and I think it can um, increase access for those who may already have it and can reduce that for those who don't who face additional challenges. I think um, what we find is that, you know, you can see that reflected in digital access 
in terms of not having enough devices, the number of families that uh, during COVID suddenly <coughs> needing extra devices, the broadband connection was less for families. It puts additional pressure on families to manage that. It means people are less connected, but also the quality of that device. It's not just about the broadband access, it's having the choice of device that's relevant. So young people might be have quite a narrow um, use of their digital technology and might not fit the, the wider sense. And we hear from um, Sally as well about a kind of slightly narrowed view of digital access that people may have. And I think there's a similarity there between older and younger generations around that. Uh, so it's one of the biggest barriers. And um, I think Jess spoke to this really well and put it really clearly about the myth of the digital native that still perceives and still goes around. And I think that's really undermines, um, it doesn't do justice to the work that young people do, but it doesn't recognise their vulnerabilities and it overplays capabilities and competencies in areas which they don't necessarily have. But also equally, it really undermines parenting and older people's abilities as well. So similarly, we may, <coughs> we may underestimate an older person's ability to navigate and use these systems and to get the most out of them because they don't have the digital capabilities that we may assess. And so we have this skewed vision of both older and younger people that I think isn't helpful in the debate at all. So slight ramble, but that's coming from um, No, I, we are exactly here to try to kind of unskew that vision of, of, of both generations and um, yes, um, share expertise on, on, on how to understand both of them, in fact. Um, Lizzie, can I come to you and ask for your um, brief intro and your perspective? Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'm a researcher and practitioner working for the last 14 years with groups and communities that are marginalised and underserved, often in a digital first or digital by default society. I particularly look at how these groups and communities uh, engage with statutory services, essential services that are needed for everyday life and, and watch how that landscape's changed over the last 14 years and looking at what we might do to, to work ground up to, to help sort of overcome some of those challenges and barriers. I, I read the Digital Youth Index with a lot of interest. I think, as uh, Sonia pointed out, you know, we have still quite a big proportion that, that can't access the internet, don't have regular access uh, ongoing, but I think we also need to think a little bit about what access means because access isn't binary. Uh, we don't have it or not have it. I think as sort of Cliff highlighted, um, there are different degrees of access, different qualities of access. And one of the interesting things is, and I think really important things to think about when we're designing and rolling out services, is the types of trade offs that people have to make in order to get the access that they need. So just brought up the, the, the point that, that digital poverty is, is for many growing as, as cost of living starts to bite. So, so what sort of trade does, has to happen within families, within friendship circles, so that you can get access to data, maybe borrow somebody else's phone because they've got more of their allowance wow. left, but but what what's the bartering system that's going on? And, and sometimes that can open up other risks for individuals. It can also really change the power dynamics. So Cliff sort of rightly said, you know, that, that, that I think that digital does indeed sort of amplify power relations, but it can also really turn them upside down. So sometimes I work with families where younger people in the family have a better spec phone than older people, and maybe that better spec phone is needed, say, to access health services, for example. So... Uh, some quite interesting interactions have to go on within the family in order to get access to 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 a higher spec phone and that doesn't always doesn't always end well um and so i think that that's something we might sort of think about the sort of the, the different shades of access i think the other thing is that in the report it makes the point very clearly all the way through that digital access is not a level playing field and i think it's important to campaign to to reduce and to, to remove um, tech poverty, data poverty. But that's not going to happen tomorrow. And I think it is really important that we start thinking about how we design and roll out products and services that are better tested for different types of constrained access, that really think about what the implications are about not only 
not having data or having limited data, for example. But what happens when you have to access some of those services in a crowded space where you might not have the physical space to 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 gain access in in quiet and calm to think about your privacy settings and what you do with security. So I often work with families where there's maybe a single parent and they are working, maybe holding down two or three jobs. They've got a lot of varying caring duties that they need to go on. They're working sometimes in, in, in crowded spaces. And then we come along and we say, so how's your, how's your password setting going or your privacy setting? And that's just not something that they have the bandwidth to really think about. So I think more sensitivity to that in the design process would be great. I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, fantastic. Thank you. Um, yes, I think we're, we're kind of beginning to map out some of the different spheres where uh, society as well as um, digital providers are kind of making the difference to people's lives in ways that aren't always, you know, we are kind of bringing out a little the, the sort of the private struggles as people engage with public services, um, engage with particular kinds of technological designs, um, seek to feel um, included. Um, and then, um, as, as Lizzie says, um, the kind of the invisible negotiations that go on in, in our everyday um, dynamics. I think there's been quite a lot of talk about um, uh, gender in that regard. And sometimes um, uh, there's a lot of research on how girls can find it harder to get access to the, to the um, quality of access. Um, so, um, uh, Jess, would you want to say something about how you see some of those negotiations in, you know, when you have to have good quality access or, or how some people might have access to better, faster connectivity than others and whether that matters? Um, it kind of depends on the position that person is in. If you're requiring the access to do homework or you know your master's some degree of studying then I would say that I've placed that importance and in families I think it's quite difficult to negotiate um you know work versus school mm -hmm. and at my home our connection is awful sometimes but that's just because we're in the middle of nowhere and the arguments that went on during the first lockdown between my sister, my dad and myself, who are all on video calls several times a day trying to negotiate who gets to go first. And yeah, yeah I, I'm, I think it really depends on the family, the position and who is what you consider to be a priority in that position, really. Mm. Thank you. UNICEF um, uses this concept of meaningful access, which I actually find really helpful, which is to say not just can you get hold of a device, but can you um, get hold of it when you need it in the context in which you need it with the kind of skills and knowledge to get the most of it in a way that does what you need it to do. I mean, it's sort of it's sort of the access question, the skills question and the purpose of going online all, all wrapped up together and all of that, you know, matters um yeah cliff um, yeah i think it's really interesting and um, we, we often forget about that plurality of stuff and families is where all of this negotiation happens yeah. uh, on a day-to-day -day level in so many so many ways and i and i think it's considering we see that <coughs> the household has access or they have x number of devices but what the reality of those micro mm. negotiations have to be and what what is being displaced when who can use the laptop first mm -hmm. and then the older child does it for the homework later on mm -hmm. and what's the kind of cognitive load that's required to manage all of that for both mm -hmm. the children themselves to kind of understand what's required there but also for the parents to negotiate all of those challenges of being able to say this is these are the conflicting demands so i think it's just an extra uh, challenge on on top of it i was just thinking also about the quality of engagement that we do. We talk about digital being a way to engage and connect with others and how important that is through services as uh, mm -hmm. as Lizzie highlighted as well. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I, is about these more subtle indicators around power dynamics and position that come through in digital access. So I was on a, um, we were looking at um, digital access and uh, communication between um, 
first families, birth families, and children who have been adopted and adoptive parents. And can, having a, an online consultation with um, uh, people who have lost children to adoption, um, along with side with social workers, and it was just so clearly evident <laughs> about you know, the horizontal the phone, the, the quality of the access, that micro delay in being able to respond to something. And um, all of those kind of sneak in to the way we present ourselves, the way we can communicate and the way we can get our views across. And when we think about children and uh, older people having a, a, a lower value in the system about expressing their views, being having their views considered properly, that I think all of those add into that. And so we the kind of an extra relegation of their views and opinions. Sally, you said something interesting I, I, I want to explore a little. I think we've talked about how younger people might be uh, struggling for access to a perhaps shared device or a limited resource within the family. My guess, and I think you said, is that older people are often in need of someone else precisely to mediate the use of a, a device for them. And they might be actually... Um, quite unlike the, the, the children fighting for space in the family, they might be on their own with the device, but without somebody to kind of play that mediating and supporting role. I don't know if that's how you see it and if that's a serious problem that we should be addressing when we think about access for older people. Yes, I think it's about the support that people need, perhaps if you are maybe didn't, you know, weren't brought up on the internet or maybe used it at work. And actually that was 15, 20 years ago, and things change. And we did, um, I did a report a few years ago about people who'd used the internet in the past but no longer did so. And I kind of called it not like riding a bike because, you know, it's not something that you do and then you have those skills forever. Mm -hmm. What you find is that, you know, when you are perhaps away from the world of work and your IT support service, if you've got one, um, you know, who do you turn to when you don't know? something's gone wrong or there's an update and you think is that a scam or is that something I need to do um, and also over time people's perhaps um, um, health issues arise or you know element of cognitive impairment which means you're a bit slower on things so some of those things it's about maintaining skills if you've got them and it's also about developing them sort of for the first time and I think I mean one of the things that during the pandemic, there's been various sort of bits of session. We know that lots of people started to use the internet more than they did before, and that's certainly the case with a lot of older people. But some of the sort of um, uh, kind of surveys found that some people were using the internet less, and that was certainly the case in some of the things that we did. And that's probably because people didn't have that support. You know, they were used to getting somebody to come around and just kind of fix whatever the issue was or they were not weren't confident in using that so being able to turn to a kind of trusted family member when you need to or to go out and get the support at local HUK who provide services or libraries or all these other places that can provide digital support it just wasn't available in the um, in the pandemic so we kind of saw that the importance to, to keep your skills and improve your skills actually sometimes does depend on on other people for those who aren't confident I and mean, it's not to say there's lots of older people who are perfectly happy and confident but i think with perhaps and thinking that's coming up all it's it's a bit more disadvantaged good members of society who are perhaps lower incomes um don't have good devices and that's whatever age you are you are more likely to have difficulties when you're coming from certain groups I, I think I think that is one question that we that we um, uh, could consider, which is whether really what we're talking about is is poverty and forms of exclusion, and they can affect um, all kinds of groups. Actually, we're just we're just here highlighting two, um, but perhaps if we address those for the the those issues for the most marginalized we would actually have solved a lot of the problems for both younger and older generations so um but that might be another debate for another day um i actually had a question for lizzie i'm still thinking about where there are similarities and differences among these generations you talked about design and folks here will know there's also you know a layer of regulation around that design that um, accessibility is um is required as well as as it were good practice i'm i'm wondering Wondering if the design and um, inclusion challenges for these two generations are actually also the same problem, or do you need to design differently for devices used by younger people and older people, or apps and platforms used by younger and older? Is it, is it okay. the one or same problem? Um, so I think it's difficult 
to neatly compartmentalize this to different generations as, mm-hmm. as I think that that's true but I think there are a range of supports needed and one of the things I wanted to to bring up sort of following on from from Sally is that it isn't just about digital well we need to sort of unpack a little bit what we mean by digital skills because mm-hmm. there's there's using the tech but there's also the fact that services banking health um education is 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 as gone online Mm -hmm. and it's also therefore about the accessibility of the logic of those services so Mm -hmm. one of the things that I uh, we we find some of the groups that we work with is whereas young people might be good at say and I just take an example maybe gaming Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that online welfare is going to be accessible to them because the logic around the welfare services is not necessarily readily understandable or accessible Mm -hmm. and so the sorts of pairwise support that that Sally's talking about could well also be needed with with younger people as Mm -hmm. they as they work with those services health is another one health over COVID went increasingly Mm -hmm. online and now really tends for many tends to be digital access first, potentially mm-hmm. in-person access second, and knowing how to navigate that interface mm-hmm. can be can be really difficult. So there's a digital skills requirement, there's a there's a safety requirement as as Jess highlighted, but I think there's also just how do I navigate the service? Mm-hmm. Um, and and I and I think so I think that there's so I think there are layers to this accessibility. Um, I think also coming you sort of sort of again coming back to your question I think that when we do this design we need to just move away from just thinking about the design of the the tech uh-huh. and think about it more roundly in the design of the service but also an area that we've really under uh, under sort of played I think when we do the rollout is what does support look like and support looks differently for different groups uh-huh. and I think to think about that and understand the economics of that not just the economics of doing it but the economics of not doing it mm-hmm. because right now I think a lot of those costs have to be picked up as just highlighted by family mm-hmm. by kin and friendship networks and it really is un uncosted labor mm-hmm. I'll stop there mm-hmm. um thank you brilliant um one other difference um that's come to my mind and um I'm going to just say well we'll come to you guys um soon um but I'm interested this is, this is a question for ev- anybody really um uh, and it comes from my thinking also about media literacy, which is one kind of early or other version of, of, of these debates about access and skills. I think and when we think about younger people, we, 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 if we decide that this is the understanding and being able to kind of use competently these technologies, if we decide that's a societal priority, then we charge the school with doing it. And I've been interested, Jess, in your views of whether schools are uh, taking on that responsibility and doing it well. But I think we have quite a question when it comes to older people, you know, who who would be the responsible bodies that would ensure fair access, that would ensure um, the spread of digital skills, that would even kind of explain the purposes for going on. You know, where, where does that, what is the responsible agent there? I don't think you want to say first about whether schools are doing a good job in this, this way. Um, I'm not sure if uh, ICT costs have changed uh, that much. <laughs> in the last three three years uh, since I was at school. Um, when I was at school, I was taught Word and PowerPoint and touch typing and Excel. actually, funnily enough, no, I had to teach myself that with YouTube later. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I was taught about how to use the computer for, for school, for work and how to sort of work my way around the programs I needed. Mm. But at, when I was at school, they sort of assumed that our parents would take the lead on teaching us about okay. uh, digital access mm-hmm. and social media and what's safe and how to recognise the problem. But I think that they need to be changed because I was teaching my mum how to use Facebook while I was figuring out how to use Facebook. And my dad, luckily, is much more savvy and is much better with technology. So he was more of a guidance for me on what to be careful of and how to keep an eye out for what's right and what's wrong. But I definitely think that 
maybe it sh ICT should touch with pastoral care and form sort of, I don't know, a, <laughs> an educational course at some point, maybe when young people start getting phones, which is around 13, because that's the age of Facebook and, and yeah. Instagram and everything else, yeah. um, that teaches them not only how to use these apps, but how to recognize when someone you don't know has added you on Instagram and how to teach young girls about um, you know, older men that they don't know popping up and yeah. trying to become friendly and teaching young boys about, I don't know, uh, gaming and sort of how to, how to toe the line between being competitive and teasing each other and bullying to the point where your parents step in and yeah. say, you know, we don't want you gaming anymore, which may then feel distanced from their friends and it then has a sort of detrimental effect on their social life. Absolutely. I would I would actually advocate beginning to teach that um, at about the age of four rather than 13. So I think uh, we should start little and gentle and embed it throughout the, the school system. But what about those who are not at school, actually, who haven't been at school for decades? Um, how, how, do, how do we reach them with any of these kind of messages about the value or the importance of, of the technology or indeed why you might not want to use it, um, but also the, the, the necessary skills? Um, Sally, yeah, I can come in on that. Yes, I mean, there isn't, I suppose, an overall government strategy, for example, to, to support people to get online. So with older people, it's very much, I guess, a bit odd hat, odd ad hoc. Um, Organisations like EDUK, Good Things Foundation, so it's a sort of voluntary sector support. Um, local authorities, particularly libraries and some local authorities run schemes, but there is a, what's it called, is it the basic skills qualification the government talks about a lot, basic digital skill. I've got the wrong name, but it's very much a getting people, it's a standard programme, getting people ready for work. And what we find is that people, they first of all, need that reason to go online. And that's even organisations that get funding. And most of our funding comes from charitable sources or, or kind of business. Some of the tech firms and banks have been very generous, but, you know, you spend a lot of your time trying to find the money in order to provide the services. But um, it's the first thing you've got to do is to sort of, give people a reason to get online you know you can't just put up a notice saying you know skills training here come along on Tuesday um, and you know I know one AGK said they went out into the, the sort of town square and they put on old music and they got people to come along and they said well look you can go onto YouTube and find the best dance of you when you got married and you you kind of find that hook to get people interested which is probably a hobby or an interest or you know, talking to the grandchildren in, in Australia, which is sort of a stereotype use, but actually a very important one. And then you bring them in to give them a bit of a taster session, and this is what you could do, and this is how you do it. And then if people are interested, it's thinking, what, well, you know, let's go at your own pace, usually one to one, um, sometimes peer to peer learning, sometimes intergenerational support with, with sort of schools and colleges, um, and quite a lot of repetition. You, you print something out, you take away. So when they get home and they switch the um, laptop on, they've got something to sort of, yeah. and then you do this and then you press that button and someone to come to and um, if you've got some issues. And then we haven't talked so much about cost yet, but again, yeah. that's yeah. an issue. The cost of the cost of equipment, the cost of um, internet. And is it worth it? You know, yes, I could afford 15, 20 pounds from work internet, but it's not a priority because I'm only going to email occasionally. It's not worth it. Uh, 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 fantastic. Um, I'm actually going to um, offer a very uh, quick summary of where I think we've got and then come to the audience and invite people to um, uh, join in. So, um, so I think I've been scribbling uh, here. Um, I, I can hear that we've made at least three arguments for why there are similarities across these um, generations. And one is the question, uh, as Sally just ended on, about kind of um, cost or the effects of poverty, essentially, that the reasons for exclusion are in many ways shared across, um, across society. And, and we maybe should be talking about poverty rather than generations. And I haven't heard anything um, so different about the kind of the skill requirements, what, it, what digital 
digital skills mean, what people need to understand in terms of data or being scammed or using the um, internet in, in, the, in a fulfilling way. So maybe the skills are kind of common. Um, and I am um, very struck by um, Lizzie's point that we need to think not just about the design of the tech, but the design of the society that requires everyone now to go online, um, young and old, and um, you can't access services. So I think there are lots of similarities. I think the differences we've heard in a way are, are more subtle. They are about the kind of the domestic circumstances in which people access um, uh, um, uh, digital services and some of the kind of power struggles and the assumptions about what's appropriate for younger people or girls or boys or what's appropriate for older people and what they um, might need um, support with and the kind of micro power plays that might um, come into um, operation are different and that has consequences for the different kinds of support that the generations um, might need. I think that was an important point. Um, we raised the question about whether for the older generation um, there is um, a point if they don't see a point. Um, there seems to be something different from saying digital is great to saying and you should be on it and we're going to make you be on it when you may have other priorities. Um, and then, as we've just discussed, um, reaching these different generations is a different kind of um, uh, has different requirements for um, for whoever is responsible. And in fact, figuring out um, uh, what role the Department of Education sees itself as playing for younger people is a question someone might want to speak to now. Um, and how to, whether leaving the challenges for the older generation to the voluntary sector, whether that's a sufficient um, approach um, and, and who is responsible when there are problems, I think also raises lots of questions. So can I um, uh, invite people to um, put up their hands and um, I'm just going to take a quick um, read of the room and say something about um, who you are and um, uh, one here. Yeah, thank you. Hi, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, uh, Andrew Campling. Um, just a couple of comments and a question. Um, so uh, on, on the skills, um, I think, I think the panel were right to call out the, the, the assumption of quotes of young people know how this stuff works. Um, it's worth remembering that many of the, uh, the sort of founding members of the sort of UK gaming industry are now retired um, and they seem to do okay with their computing knowledge. Um, yet, until very recently, ICT in schools mainly moved away from teaching programming and teaching how to use different packages. Mm. So knowledge of, and understanding how things work mm. disappeared. Mm. Thankfully, the curriculum has just changed, so that's now coming back. But so, otherwise, mm. actually, older people are more likely to have general skills and understanding than, than younger people in terms of how the stuff functions. Um, in terms of safety and security, um, there are quite a few very good free tools that do mm. things like opt you out of cookies mm. on sites without mm. you having to scroll through loads of stuff to press the mm. button. Um, and I'm not sure whether the agencies are aware of those or recommend them. And, and mm. similarly, things like password managers, which are free, which give you much better security than, yeah, I've got this same password I use in these 50 different sites. That must be okay. Mm. Um, uh, on, on the, the thing that hasn't been touched on is in terms of uh, exclusion uh, is I mean, there's plenty of research which tells you that people that don't have internet access pay more for stuff um, on the whole uh, because they don't have the easy ability to look and compare yeah. sort of pricing uh, and so on. So, yeah, I think that's actually increasingly important. Um, okay. but, should, we, should we take that as a... But, as a but can I just throw the question at yeah. you? So on the social tariffs, um, I think £15 seems to be about the going rate for a social tariff, but you need to have certain things like uh, to be accessing certain um, uh, uh, grants or whatever to, in, in order to qualify for them. You can't just automatically buy them. And I don't know if the panel think that those conditions are fair or whether the access needs to be broadened. Mm. Thank you. Does anyone have a view on? Sure. Um, not a particularly formed view, but I know that um, um, Kat Dixon, who's a um, um, fellow for the <clears throat> Good Things Foundation Digital Fellowship, I think, work with Nominate, uh, wrote a, a really good piece about the low uptake of those social tariffs and of how how that requires 
um, additional work again by yeah. people who already have a, a large number and being able to understand the choices that are available and collating all of that information. So I think whilst there's some really good schemes like the data bank um, yeah. that a number of the telecoms uh, providers have been providing. So there's some good schemes there, <clears throat> but I think a lot of those systems, as you rightly say, are kind of tied up in um, kind of the bureaucracy which requires a level of understanding and a commitment to be able to, to resolve those. I, don't, I, I can't speak to the value of them and whether people would feel that they're actually good value. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know enough about that, but I suspect mm -hmm. that there's a bit of a, it's kind of, it'll do. And it's a bit of, you know, is it enough to have really low grade connection for family if gaming is really important? And mm -hmm. it comes back into that level of access again about these um identifiers about your lack of uh, participation in society as well yeah. i think so i think there's a element there thank you um were you good oh sorry oh, did you want sorry. to come in no so I was just going to yeah. say something yeah good about thing. social tariffs and yeah. yeah and the good things foundation sort of leaflet on on cost and access and things mm -hmm. is really good um yeah social tariffs it's very people don't know about them they don't claim mm. them um, some of them they're linked to mainly linked to benefit receipt there's a couple of them that are linked to universal credit but not pension credit so I suppose that's something that we're kind of picking up on is that they actually don't work for some of the sort of older people's benefits um, mm. and I'm not sure how much companies are promoting them because they want to have them say they've got them but I don't know how keen they are for really people picking them up and I think there's always the issue if you're linked to a benefit or what if you just got slightly too much income for that um so it's it's a good thing and they should be promoted but probably don't solve the problem for everybody on their own say something very quickly about comparison websites because I think that's a really mm. it's a really important point mm. so we've some couple of projects that we have, we, 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 we look at what purchasing power is, internet. What's interesting, I think what's important, you're right, but it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of organization to do that comparison. And we've looked at doing it maybe in a community setting, because that's something community activity can do. So I think these are important benefits, but all the other things that we need to do to get that to work also I think need to, need to be brought out and there is a there is a lot of work in, implied for the user isn't there of kind of checking and knowing and discovering what these what these opportunities are which um you kind of have to know already in order to know that you need to find out i think is is often the the trap people are in were you going to ask a question or were you going to bring one from the on the uh, no this is a question that i have actually yeah, i'd be really you. keen to hear from panelists on you know when we think about uh I was just wondering, how does the conversation change or become more complicated or nuanced when we take into consider, uh, consideration other identities? So things like race, um, nationality, because like when I think about myself, for example, um, before well, as a 10 year old, I was helping my parents with online banking, which now I think you uh, referenced uh, the point um, cognitive load, which <laughs> I now, now um, can, can identify with. But I was just wondering before, you know, digital was a, a challenge, actually language was a barrier for, for my parents and that's why I had to support. So it'd be interesting just to hear your views on how this conversation gets sort of further um, nuanced when we uh, broaden the, the uh, perspectives a bit more. Brilliant, thank you. And who would like to, I, I'm often very struck how much um, the internet operates in, in the one language and we don't have good, data I think I'm now looking at Ofcom on the on on whether we know who who is excluded by by services not being in, in sufficient languages but um, no, not not specific data but I know from work with um, young people young carers is a, is a huge group offering them to help parents with medical issues and it brings up a lot of challenges around when we see again the family being this focus of digital equity we, we've talked about a lot of skills and access to but equity I think is the key word here about young people are having to do again that extra cognitive load to, to access those services to, to support the family to achieve yeah. what they're wanting to do so whether that's translation skills whether it's being able to navigate yeah. the gp booking system mm -hmm. um but then it's also are the systems as lizzie identified are they built to accommodate that so if it's yeah. you know being able to report issues being able to uh, uh, 
access things on behalf of others. So I think about groups like young carers as well, um, mm -hmm. care leavers and, and young people who looked after children. So young people with independent living skills go, moving into their own often haven't had that support. So they have to face these new challenges about digital access costs and looking up the, the different sites, mm -hmm. those kinds of things as well. So I think um, yeah, it's certainly, and we know literacy levels directly correlate to, mm. um, you know, a lot of media literacy challenges as well. So again, I think literacy, basic literacy skills is something that's overlooked massively in, in a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Does anyone else want to? Yeah. So I think also just to follow on from, from what Cliff said, I think the other, another thing that, that, that comes out when I read the Digital Youth Index report, there's a sort of an emphasis on, on parents and adults being um, sort of the entities that really support internet practices and behaviours. But that kind of gets turned on its head if we have young people helping their parents online. Where does that power relation, has that power relation shift? And so I think also who we think of as being supporters, advice givers, I think needs to be also sort of considered um, in, that, in, in, in that context. Yeah. Just, just come back. We've, we've covered lots of ground, and one thing that I think there's a we can get lost in all these different elements mm. and the, the risk of. Uh, and there's two bits that have struck me from today. So one is we do a lot of work with the UK Council for Internet Safety Digital Resilience Framework, and it always feels like a good handle for a number of these things. And that's there's four elements to developing digital resilience, which is around understanding risk. And we know that children may have less developed capabilities to understand risk, but also that, and that older people may be able to help them understand those risks. But equally, that can flip around as well. There's knowing what to do if that risk is inappropriate. And again, where's that power dynamic? Who do you turn to for that support? If you're a, an elderly couple living quite isolated, like as, as Sally highlighted, or if you're a child who has more technical capabilities, do you know where to turn to? If you're turning to the service, is that service designed to, to be able to understand your, your, your request? And then um, learning between contexts and previous experience. So you may be quite digitally capable in one context, as Sally talked about, in a work context, but in a social media context, it's quite different. And equally for a young person might be quite capable and be able to understand the risks within a social media space, but less so in a more formal educate in a workspace, for example. Mm -hmm. And then importantly, is the recovery. And most of this always starts at the point of recovery when people identify the need when something hasn't worked, they've not been able to achieve what they want to do. So how do we collectively support people to recover so that they don't miss out on these opportunities? And I think the resilience framework gives us a handle on some of it. And that links into another point, which in the earlier session, and I think the rest of today, there's a lot of technical, obviously, given the forum that we're in, it's very technical um, thing. And we and we I, it tends to lead us because digital is this technical thing. We, we start to think in technical terminology but with people who are using this and it's very emotional response that people are taking so sadly talks about the motivation why and, and why young people doing it we and i think we need to often consider that motivation and the values that are going into it so we talk about how we block content online the, the specifics of the online safety bill but getting back to some it's people who are using the technology and i think there's a risk even in the debates about the technology that we're losing the sight mm -hmm. of the people mm -hmm. that are actually there i'm not sure i'm making my point clear but <laughs> there's a risk in these debates that we yeah. focus on the features of the debate rather than no. the people that's affected yeah no no i see your point and i would add also the institutions that are developing particular kinds of processes that assume technology will be accessible or used in, in particular ways uh, there was a question just here Oh, no, you're just giving me a time warning. Ah, sorry. OK. Um, OK, so this is kind of last question, last moment. Um, yeah, please. No, I, mean, I was just going to say, when you start talking about trying to use schools to put place any sort of integration, intergenerational knowledge, if I think back to one of the common things that gets said is that schools should also teach financial literacy is often yeah. a common thing that's said. If I think back to when I was at school, the canonical mortgage 
was an endowment mortgage with full tax relief. Mm -hmm. So if you followed that advice 10 years mm -hmm. later, you would be in an extraordinarily bad place. Mm -hmm. And the rate of change of the things that we're talking about, and it's not worth going back to when I did O-level computer studies in the 1970s, because mm -hmm. that comparison isn't necessarily relevant. Mm -hmm. But there is this huge rate of change to both the technology and the social context of it. And mm -hmm. assuming that you can do that in schools and then just sort of the fire and forget thing, Mm. It's got to be far more about a continuing form of education mm. than, than, and, and saying you know, whether or not you learn an old version of word at school is entirely mm. irrelevant. Mm. I mean, I, I, I think if, if I don't know if there are teachers here in the room, I think they would hope that they teach ways of learning that will last you a lifetime rather than knowledge that's out of date in, in a few years. But um, I, um, that's that's a question. I think Jess wants to comment on that. Um, I yeah. would say that a lot of my friends and I have all said the same thing at some point in the last few years, which is, why did we not get taught anything about financial yeah. financial life in general? What what is a what is a mortgage? Is one of the first questions that I ever heard one of my friends say about this kind of thing. And why weren't we taught about it? And yeah. you're right, everything progresses so quickly that it's out of date within a month or a year. Yeah. But learning the terms and learning a basis which you can then build upon later in life is very very important I definitely wish I'd learned more yeah. financial advice basically um while at school and yeah. luckily my dad's very financially savvy so he's taught me but yeah. I think all of my friends feel the same way is that yeah. our basis that we learned at school was great but we didn't get taught any uh internet safety or internet privacy Mm. and the same for financial mm. intelligence really and just mm. facts mm. thank you Can I just just yep. to add on to that point i think um yeah there's a risk of sort of the whack-a-mole approach which we see that, that parents mm. also face and you get how do you yeah. stay up to date with everything and that mm. can then undermine so the teachers will lack confidence to go to teachers because like i don't know all of the things so i think coming back to some of those principles about media literacy and how mm. do you understand it mm. but uh, on a personal level I think I would advocate for a history of the internet as a core element of uh, curriculum because I think someone talked about the materiality of the internet and how things actually work and I think mm. having a, an understanding of the how the, the the cables and the wi-fi and the systems actually work but also where the internet actually came from that it existed before facebook um, and that there is an alternative because if you can't imagine an alternative then the young people can't ever um, get us to that different point as well and a young person i always remember saying well the internet was built to sell you adverts and it was just quite sad to hear that but you can mm. fully understand that and i think mm. a bit of a history of the internet being a core part of curriculum for everybody i think would be quite interesting so i, th I think there's some folks here who might be uh, willing to design that <laughs> and uh, in input into that um, I have to say, from my research, I, it, it worries me um, when I hear that kind of fallback from school to parents, because, um, as you say, Jess, some parents are able to take on that role and provide their children with the support and knowledge they need, and others aren't. And it's yet another way in which, in a way, we build in um, inequalities. Um, so I have had my kind of five minute warning a little while ago um, and um, so and everyone is about to have lunch. So we should um, uh, draw to a close and perhaps I can draw to the clo a close by asking the panellists one last very quick fire question. Since this is the um, UK IGF, um, have you got a message, a recommendation for the IGF folk on what should be done to improve things for either or both of these generations. Um, and I'll take you in any order, but a last thought to leave the idea with. <laughs> okay, Lizzie is going to pick us up. So I would definitely call for shifting uh, design and rollout practices so that we, we test for different types of constraint. Very good, thank you. So um, by design solutions in a way in advance of for getting out, yes, conceived broadly. Good, Sally, I think you were. Um, yeah, I don't know if it's a specific recommendation. I mean, my priority is about access to services and support that are essential. And I think making sure that digital enables but doesn't exclude. So I think the design issue, which Lizzie talked about is, is really important. Um, I think the skills, improving the skills for people who can and want to access it 
but digitally and yeah. making sure their service is still available offline, accessible mm -hmm. in any way. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, Jess? Um, I would say teaching the parents as well as the children and more importantly, teaching digital resilience and how to raise your children to be resilient to whatever they might encounter on the internet uh, so that a children aren't put under the pressure of being the most tech, tech savvy person in their family and also mm -hmm. parents know that their children are going to be safe because they know how to guide them and they also know more skills that are going to help them anyway thank you um, I, think, I think Jess summed it up quite well about mm. you know, developing digital resilience at parents' own way, starting to look at de developing a design pattern library for um, resilience by design, so not just safety by design. So I think mine would be to go beyond compliance and to think about what are people wanting to achieve when they're online and how do we help them to achieve that? So mm. start from an optimistic point of view. How can we help people to achieve what they want to remove the barriers mm -hmm. and stop it? Mm -hmm. I, I love that this um, panel has become kind of quite, um, it's become ambitious in, you know, what, what it is we want um, a digital society to deliver for people in all their very different circumstances and recognising that the barriers are absolutely social and economic as well as um, digital. So I think that's a good place to um, charge everyone with uh, going away and making the right recommendations to improve matters. Um, am I going to thank everyone or are you about to thank everyone? <laughs> Oh, I'm going to thank everyone then very much on this panel um, for a brilliant conversation. Thank you so much. I like my mic's working now. <laughs> um, you know, thank you so much. That was a really fascinating panel. It definitely made me reflect on my own relationship with uh, digital technology growing up. Um, and may, I hope you also you know, ha had the same thoughts as you were listening to the panel. Um, we are now going to break for uh, lunch, so which is going to be served in the atrium. Um, we're going to be back at uh, one twenty, so uh, back in this room. So please help yourself uh, and we'll see you for the afternoon. Uh, thank you so much uh, and we'll see you later.